I want to welcome you to our inaugural CHE Connections live webinar. This is our first event in a new webinar series meant to provide information to our alumni and friends about activities within the Department of Chemical Engineering, as well as highlights from our alumni. Uh, we hope to have three to four of these events each year, um, and they'll be announced through the alumni email system and on our departmental website. In future webinars, you might expect to get a report on the state of the department from the head, hear about upcoming changes in our programs, or hear from one of our alumni about their experiences in, as an example, a non-traditional career path or special service activity. And of course, we want to highlight the research being conducted in the department by our students and faculty. The first event today will focus on some very timely work being carried out in Professor Ducker's lab with his students and collaborators. William's going to take about 30 minutes to describe some of his recent work to combat the coronavirus. There will be time at the end for questions. You can feel free to unmute your microphone and ask a question or type a question into the chat function in Zoom. I'll monitor the chat and I can pass the questions along to Dr. Ducker. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to William. Okay, thank you very much, Dave, for uh, uh, inviting me to give this talk. It's a great pleasure to give it. And thank you to everyone in the audience who um, decided to come along and hear about what's going on in the department. So um, I'm gonna be talking about some work we've been do doing on surface coatings that inactivate SARS-CoV-2. Um, as Dave said, I'm very happy to have questions. I think the spirit of this is that it's a Friday afternoon colloquium. Uh, it's an informal thing. I don't even mind if, you know, in the middle of my talk, you want to interrupt to ask a question rather than saving it to the end. That's fine by me. Just unmute and come on in. Um, anyway, so first thing I want to say was this is clearly a collaboration between several individuals, the research I'm talking about. Um, there are a couple of graduate students, Saeed Bezadinazab and Mohsen Hosseini, who were working in my lab and also critically a couple of collaborators at the University of Hong Kong, Alex Chin and Leo Poon. Um, well, really you'd have to be living under a rock to not know about COVID-19, but I thought I'd at least mention at the beginning. Um, this in my mind has been a very serious incident. Um, 110 million people approximately have been infected worldwide and about 2.5 million uh, people have died. And I think we're all used to looking at these sorts of graphs with what's happened over time. It's just astonishing uh, how serious this disease has been for everybody. Um, in the United States in particular, um, it's been heavily impacted. And I think uh, there are many metrics to measure this, but an important one is excess deaths because it's hard to attribute things to coronavirus. But if you look at the excess deaths, uh, it gives you an overall impression of whether there have been more deaths in this period of time. Um, and on this graph here, you can see the time axis and then the deaths. This is the influenza um, that was bad in 2018. And um, this is what happened in 2020. So the blue bars are the actual deaths the orange represents something that's statistically significant if it's above that. So all of this region is statistically significant excess deaths, which are quite large, like 15, 20, in some cases, 25% excess deaths over the normal deaths uh, that occur in one week. So it's had a huge impact on the death toll in America. Um, likewise, the GDP, has been affected. This is a plot of change in GDP over preceding quarter, pretty flat around three or 4%. And then this is 2020. And of course, this would have been much worse if it weren't for massive intervention from the federal government uh, in the term in terms of stimulating the economy. So this is kind of a weird slide that I've got here. But um, if you think of disasters that can occur, there's kind of a hierarchy. So you know, I put at the top there, 
an invasion by an alien species which could devastate the entire world. And then I've got at the bottom, you know, a student saying they need three more points on question four. I think that's sort of the spectrum of our human experience. Um, you know, right at the top, there's nuclear war, climate change, world war. Um, I originally wrote this list out um, with a few more things, but it depends heavily on your interpretation of history and what's important. Um, then we've got COVID-19 somewhere there. So how you responded to COVID-19 depends a little bit on your hierarchy. Um, this I started doing sort of as a joke, but I think this is interesting for people to do, to think about, you know, how bad is this COVID-19 pandemic? So, um, and at what point do you say this is important that you go sufficiently important that you're going to stop what you're doing and pay attention to this? So I started to think this in like March of last year, you know, this is a significant event. It's not a nuclear war, but it is something significant. So I started to think about uh, what can I actually do to help with the situation? Um, you know, I'm a scientist, I'm working on other topics. At this time, I was mainly focused on studying diffusion in narrow cracks. Um, you know, when years go by, would, when I thought back about this period, was that actually the most important thing to do? I thought, well, I actually have the potential to work on something to do with COVID-19. So perhaps I should switch over to doing that. So I'm saying this partly for young people in the audience. Um, you know, hopefully we won't have anything like COVID-19 for a while, but um, you know, there are, are well, there is a spectrum of different disasters that can influence our lives. Um, so COVID-19 uh, is a disease uh, that's caused by a virus. Um, when I started to think about this, we just started to have group meetings within our research group where we met um, weekly to discuss what we could possibly do. That was sort of like part-time. Um, you know, what, what should our response be of our research group to this unfolding disaster? Uh, first, we were just trying to understand things about the virus. My student Mosin gave a talk on what SARS-CoV-2 is. That was the first talk uh, we had. Uh, then we started going for more frequent group meetings. And then we started to get a list of topics. So we thought about various topics. I think the first and most obvious one was to study air filtration. Um, we just discussed whether we should work on masks and Professor Mike Bortner from our department worked on masks, on producing masks. We thought about drugs uh, and in fact, Professor Sanket Deshmuth um, is doing some very good research on drugs that might bear fruit quite soon. Um, in the end, we decided to look at anti-SARS-CoV-2 coatings, mainly because that's where my skill set was. It was the smallest perturbation uh, in research where I thought I could make a more immediate impact. So um, to understand what we're doing, we have to think a little bit about infection routes, uh, how you, the SARS-CoV-2 can enter your body to give you COVID-19. The main route is via respiratory droplets or aerosols. I think everyone is familiar with this. So somebody sneezes or breathes out an aerosol, that's what these blue droplets, sorry, a respiratory droplet, that's what these blue droplets are, that could end up becoming an aerosol. And the person could breathe in the aerosol or the respiratory droplet and get COVID-19 um, from that. There's a secondary route um, via a solid. So a person breathes out and puts a droplet on a solid and then another person comes along and touches that, uh, gets SARS-CoV-2 on their hand and then touches their hand to their face and gets infected that way. So this route has been uh, found in hamster studies uh, and epidemiological studies uh, recently in Britain 
suggests that about 25% of infections occur via this route. Um, it's difficult to tell which route is operating for any individual. I think the World Health Organization did describe it very well on their website. People who come into contact with potentially infectious surfaces often also have close contact with infectious people, making the distinction between respiratory droplet and fomite transmission difficult to discern. So fomite is when uh, you have a surface that's contaminated. So it's difficult to say which is the most important mechanism. I think there's universal agreement, sorry, there's universal agreement that this is the most important mechanism, but it's difficult to say exactly the balance between these two. But we'll be talking about research to stop this mechanism. Um, well, I just missed a page, I think. Um, so what we want to do is to make a surface. Our, our research goal was to make a surface where um, we would reduce the fraction of virus that would survive on the surface. So over some time, uh, the virus could become inactivated by an active surface. Having difficulty controlling it at the moment. Um, so this only really would matter if the virus lasted quite a long time on the solid. So um, a group at the NIH, um, first author Van Dora Milan did a study um, where they looked at how much virus would survive on a surface. And on the vertical axis here, we have the tighter the amount of virus surviving and on the horizontal axis, we have the time in hours. And what this showed was that the virus does linger around for a while on surfaces. So um, that led to, this got into the popular press and led to a lot of worries of people touching surfaces. Because if you look at these different surfaces, for example, on plastic, uh, even after 72 hours, there's a detectable amount of SARS-CoV-2 on a solid. So that means that if one person sneezed on a solid and a second person touched it, even three days later, they could potentially become infected. Of course, it's dropping down in um, amount of virus over that time. But this led people to become quite worried. And the second paper came out by Chin et al., who ended up being our collaborator. And um, this showed a similar sort of trend. Um, amazingly, on the outer surface of a mask, for up to one week after, means that there is a probability that you will catch the disease by touching that object up to a week later, which is pretty scary. I mean, everyone was scared about that. If you go to the supermarket and you touch the checkout, you know, it might only be a few minutes after the previous person. So um, our research concept is that to cut off this chain going from the infected person to the person getting infected, we would engineer a coating that would inactivate the virus such that by the time the next person touched it, uh, they would get a smaller dose of virus. So this is where the engineering comes in, a coating, which is represented by this different color, which reduces infection. Uh, there's a secondary opportunity for engineering that we could, even if the virus were still active, we could diminish the transfer probability from a solid to a hand, which would also be effective. So the basic hypothesis of my group research was that a coating can be used to speed inactivation of SARS-CoV-2 and the application would be apply that coating to communal objects to reduce the spread of the disease. And this is what we've got in mind, a grab bar that you might have on a subway that's coated and that coated surface reduces the infection or some door handle uh, that's coated to reduce transmission of the disease. Okay, so what are the desirable features of the coating. Uh, of course, you want to inactivate the virus quickly. 
you know, to check out, you'd want to inactivate the virus in maybe a minute or 30 seconds or at a subway, a similar time. A second infection is we want an ongoing or continuous kill. Um, it's not much point if this is used once and then the coating no longer kills the virus. We want it to do it all day, every day for months. So you could put it on a subway railing you know, it would be killing at nine o'clock in the morning, killing at 9.30, et cetera, et cetera, for months or years. And of course, applicable to everyday objects, high durability, easy to apply. So the basic parameters that we have uh, for achieving this are, and we want to have an active material, some sort of support structure, and we'd like to have an appropriate morphology. So it's kind of hard, to envisage this now, but when we started working on this, we didn't even know what inactivated the virus. That was not a known. We had to start thinking about it. So that was the first objective. And this, this was, these were the later objectives. So when you're looking for an active material, there's two things you can do. You can have a deliberate design where I conceive, I know something about the virus. How will I actively inactivate the virus? or I could look at other things that I already know inactivate other viruses, and I assume that they'll also inactivate SARS-CoV-2. So my background is in self-assembly of objects. So my natural inclination as a scientist who does self-assembly was to do the deliberate design approach. So I know that the virus assembles spontaneously. So that spontaneous assembly depends on solution conditions. Um, and if you upset the solution conditions, you can destabilize the virus. And that's how ethanol hand sanitizer works or soap works. Or alternatively, you could knock out a necessary function like one of the um, protein receptors. So I started thinking about changing the environment. I knew that self-assembly depended critically on the charge balance. Um, and I thought if we used a highly charged surface, we would be able to uh, inactivate the virus. So we worked on engineering a surface where we had a poly electrolyte tethered onto the solid and that it would dangle out into suspension a long way because the virus is hundred nanometers in diameter. So we needed this film to be hundred nanometers in thickness so it could dangle out and wrap around the virus and inactivate the virus. So this type of approach worked very well at killing bacteria uh, and we thought it would work. So how do you test this? Uh, you obviously can't test this on humans. Uh, there's a proxy that one can use. It's called a model. Uh, what people used were green monkey kidney cells and our collaborator used these. They're called Vero E6 cells. And you can tell whether the cells are damaged just by looking at them down a microscope. So here's healthy cells and here's damaged cells. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about this test, but essentially what the test is, it's the level of dilution that's necessary to see an effect. So if you have to dilute it, the suspension of virus a lot, it means it's a very potent suspension. It's very active and that's a bad thing. If you don't need to dilute it a lot, uh, in order to get rid of any effect, that means it's not a very potent viral suspension. So we basically look at how much dilution is necessary to cause that visual effect that I showed you. So um, here's the results of our film. Um, so here's the viral titer as a function of time. So six means you need a 10 to the six fold dilution dilution, well, in fact, a 10 to the fourfold dilution before you don't notice any effect. So that's very bad. You have to dilute it one part and 10 to the thousand in order for you not to see it kill mammalian cells. And what we found with polyalamine is that compared to glass, I've got a control uncoated and coated, there was absolutely no effect. Um, this is just the natural decline of the virus, which decays on its own. So there was no effect. So this was very sad for us. Um, at my first shot, my shot that I conceived um, didn't work at all. 
So I just need to go back in history now about how we actually got to do this work. Um, of course, I had many ideas about how you can code a surface, but this was not really a planned out research program. It was like, what can I do um, to try and kill SARS-CoV-2? So I, I'm very good at making coatings and studying coatings, but I really hadn't even heard of SARS-CoV-2 before this disaster. Well, it didn't even exist, but you know, I, I didn't even know about viruses that much. So I had to find a collaborator. So that was really a rate limiting step. So how do you find a collaborator in a hurry? Well, of course I contacted the authors of those first two papers. So I contacted um, Van, Van Dora Marlin's group um, leader, um, Munster, and he never got back to me. So that was very frustrating. Uh, I waited like six weeks where I was emailing this guy because we needed to have a test, but obviously he was working on other things, didn't have time. So eventually I just thought, well, I have to find another collaborator, but there are only really two people. One was in the United States and one was in Hong Kong. They were the only two people that had published work like this that could do the test. So one night after dinner, I finally gave up and um, said, well, I'll just, just, I'll contact Poon in Hong Kong and see where the answer. So like at seven o'clock in the evening, I emailed him and then I was still working at my computer at and then at 7.15, he emailed me back and said, this sounds like a good idea. He's always very brief. This sounds like a good idea. Let's talk. So I was so excited. I mean, I think that was, that was an incredibly exciting moment in my career where he actually answered that email. And we had a chat on Skype. And he said to me, William, I'll give you one shot. Send me one sample. And this is the sample that... I sent it, but it didn't work. But the night before we sent this sample, or maybe two nights before, I was saying to Saeed and Mosin, well, you know, we've got to ship this thing to Hong Kong. It's kind of a pain to ship it over there. What really is the harm in putting in, you know, two or three samples? And um, maybe he'll test more than this. So um, he said he was only going to, look at one sample, but in fact, he looked at all three samples. Um, so this was the second sample, uh, Padadmac. It's a very common antibacterial, antimicrobial that's used, for example, in Unilever in their products. Uh, it's also a quaternary ammonium. Didn't do anything. Didn't do anything at all. That was shot number two. Of course, you know, I wouldn't be giving this talk if shot number three didn't work. Um, I said there are two approaches. One is deliberate design, uh, which had failed, which failed. And the other is consider what works. So I looked at the research from Van Dora Marlin and clearly copper worked much better than stainless steel. So I thought, okay, copper's good. Let's make some better version of copper. I um, obviously knew that the inactivation was something to do with the surface. So um, I looked up my first year chemistry textbook from many years ago and learned that the surface of copper is cuprous oxide. And then I started researching cuprous oxide and found that somebody had put some particles of cuprous oxide into suspension. Uh, it's Japanese group Sonata, and they showed that it kills bacteriophage virus. So I thought, okay, let's try a surface bound layer as opposed to a suspension. We'll make a coating out of cuprous oxide. So um, the way we did that was we applied a thin layer of polyurethane onto a surface using a sponge. We allowed it to partially cure. And then we covered the film um, with a cuprous oxide suspension and ethanol. The ethanol was to suspend the cuprous oxide, but also it softens the polyurethane and it allows polymer migration. Um, we end up with a coating that looks like this. To my eye, it's red or brown, but many people in Virginia Tech think this looks uh, maroon or burgundy. Um, I'm not really sure. I guess it's the color is in the eye of the beholder there. Um, so what do the results look like? Um, this is the same sort of graph that I showed you before. Um, this is the viral titer. This means we've got lots of active virus, 
and this means not much active virus. And this is completely different to the ammonium compounds. So in one hour already this coating, uh, come the amount of virus gets down to the detection limit. There's so little virus uh, that you can't detect the virus. So the reduction is more than 99.98% in one hour. Now biologists like to talk in logs, which is equivalent to what we as chemical engineers might call orders of magnitude. So there's three and a half orders of magnitude here because this is a log scale. So a biologist would call that 3.64 log units of reduction. So that's the formula for, for how do you calculate log reduction. So however you count it, it's a really dramatic change in viability of SARS-CoV-2. So of course we were super happy about this result. Um, looking at some short-term results. So I've just changed the horizontal scale and there's just a lot more data there. The half-life of the virus uh, is in the range 2.5 to 4.2 minutes. So about three minutes. So three minutes is pretty rapid inactivation of the virus for a coating when you consider you know, on stainless steel without anything, it's lasting for days. So this is getting down to this type of limit that we were hoping for, where you could envisage multiple people going through some sort of checkout or the TSA or something, and the virus being inactivated in between uses. Okay, of course, to be a useful coating, it would have to also work on other materials. So we've checked the coating on various materials like here on stainless steel, it's a pretty similar result. So um, we published this last year uh, in the early summer in ACS Applied Materials and Interfaces. And it really interested me that the world is so interested in SARS-CoV-2, I mean, justifiably, this got a lot of press coverage. So um, I was interviewed on BBC World and NPR, which was a big thrill for me because they're actually news um, media that I listen to myself. And also it was on television on you know the major networks. So that was kind of a, a weird thing for me. I had only once before been interviewed by the press and suddenly um, this was a hot item that was on lots of different news media. So that, that was interesting um, being interviewed for that. I mean, probably the most exciting was the few live interviews I had. Most of these were recorded, but having a live interview is pretty fun where you can hear them talking about the weather and the news, you know, on the stream, and then suddenly they switch to you and, you know, you're talking live. So that even if you're a professor used to talking to a, um, an audience, that was, that was an interesting experience to have that. Um, anyway, so back to the science. Of course, if you make a film of polyurethane and cuprous oxide, you don't know which of the two it activates SARS-CoV-2 and you get a result. So we checked whether polyurethane was the active ingredient and clearly it wasn't, um, the, the polyurethane didn't do anything. Okay, the other thing, the other criterion we set for ourselves was we needed an ongoing kill. So this is the same graph of how quickly the virus is killed, but the big difference is now we've done five disinfection cycles. So this is trying to simulate multiple users going through a checkout. So uh, a cycle is exposure to SARS-CoV-2, then disinfection, and then just repeating, then putting SARS-CoV-2 back on again, disinfecting, going round and round and round, and just seeing whether the material can both survive repeated exposures to the virus and repeated exposures to a disinfectant. Because if you're using this in hospitals, um, the staff will probably clean it with ethanol anyway, because they, they need to disinfect it, the solid from all sorts of different um, pathogens. So it works very well in these multiple cycles. Um, we're also worried about just getting wet when people are wiping things down. It still works fine uh, 13 days underwater. So at this point, I was super excited. I thought we had something that was very uh, good. And um, my objective was really to start coding door handles at Virginia Tech. 
So this is where I turned from being like a researcher to someone who was actually trying to start an operation. So the first thing I did was contact uh, the major world supplier of cuprous oxide and order 200 pounds of cuprous oxide so that I could start coding door handles. Um, they um, gave me a quote for that. I rang up and spoke to the vice president of Chemet Corporation and he said, that'll be 1500 bucks. And I said, okay, that's very good. But uh, actually I'm just a private individual and that's quite a lot of money for me to pay. Um, could you give me a discount? Like how about a thousand bucks? And we negotiated backwards and forwards and eventually he agreed on a thousand dollars plus the $200 shipping from Montana. And I was very happy about that. Um, and then amazingly, like 10 minutes later, he rang back and said, well, I think we need to do our bit for the COVID pandemic. How would you like to just get it for free? So that was great. He sent for free 200 pounds of the stuff. Then I started working on a permit to buy ethanol in bulk to do it and getting the polyurethane and organizing with various people around Virginia Tech campus to coat all these door handles. And then EH and S um, asked me whether I had a permit from the state government to use this. And then I spent an enormous amount of time trying to find who the permit would be from. And eventually it led me to the EPA who said, who gave me the rules for how you could um, coat a surface. And basically that was in June and I still haven't met all the requirements. I won't go into that in detail, but the reason why this did not immediately get off the ground was that it's not legal to do this because the EPA has declared that a virus is a pest and therefore anything you use against it is a pesticide and therefore it has to undergo all this testing with the EPA. So that is quite an ongoing uh, issue getting that testing done. The problem is that it costs $70,000 to do that. So I was happy to fork out 1K to code all the door handles at Virginia Tech, but 70K was a bit too much for me. Um, we're still going through that procedure and we have an emergency approval to use it in the state of Virginia that has been grinding its way through the state of Virginia. And we're very close to getting approval. So it's quite possible this could be implemented at Tech this spring, but um, thank God the vaccine people have got going and that has been a great success and that's going to work, you know, on the same time scale. Um, just a comment about getting something to market, um, even though um, maybe the COVID pandemic might wane, I hope it does wane, um, we have found that this coating is extremely good against other viruses, fungi, bacteria, MRSA, all these other pathogens that are, were important and still are important. It seems to work against them. So I'm working to try and make a company out of this. We just got some funding for proof of concept um, from Virginia Tech. Uh, I'm looking for an angel investment to get it going and other investments. I've teamed up with Gary Whiting, another professor who some of you might know from the department. He's looking at the marketing, uh, the voice of the customer and the minimum viable product. And we're still working on the regulatory um, activities. It's the objective. Um, it's got high durability. It's mechanically robust. We can coat things like checkout facilities and pens that you'd use at a checkout. Uh, I've coated a supermarket trolley. Um, this was fun at the supermarket when Saeed and I went to a supermarket and asked whether we could coat a trolley. And the guy said, you can do it as long as you don't tell anyone which supermarket it is. But if this works, I want to be the distributor and handle all the, you know, handling within the supermarket. So that was um, fun doing that. Um, I just want to talk for a couple of minutes about the future, um, just a few minutes. So we made a coating that, in a, that has a, where the virus has a half-life of like three minutes. Ideally, 
if you're going to have a coating that really doesn't have any virus or no MRSA or whatever on it, you know, within minutes, that's a tough task. So this is where knowledge of chemical engineering comes in. Um, I think it's obvious that it's not the inactivation step that's rate limiting when you need to uh, inactivate something in minutes. Uh, it's the transport. So if you have a dropper that lands on a surface, you need diffusion between either of the virus to the surface or the active ingredient out to the virus and diffusion over the length scale of millimeters is hopeless. You're never going to do, um, you know, that takes hours. You're never going to achieve that no matter how good your active surface is. Um, what we rely on, the reason why we're able to do it faster than that is evaporation of the droplet. But that's relying on evaporation isn't that good. It depends on humidity. So the solution is to imbibe the droplet into a porous film. So as soon as you imbibe it in there, first of all, you've got a lot more area of active ingredient. But the main thing is now the diffusion length is the size of the porosity. So if we make this porosity on the scale of microns, well, then diffusion takes only minutes. So a porous film is the way to go. So we recently had this published, a paper uh, by Mohsen Hassani uh, that was on the front cover of Applied Materials and Interfaces. And this is Mohsen's brother's, the artist's impression of what happens. Uh, the virus comes in and gets in all these small cracks and is rapidly inactivated. So uh, we sintered a material into a rock-like material and its imbibation, that is the fluid coming in there, is really fast. So 0% humidity, pretty much it comes in in about 30 seconds. Uh, even at 95% humidity, which is about the most humid conditions you get, you know, it's get down there in a minute. Um, compared to if you have a non-porous solid, it's just sitting there waiting to evaporate in the same time. So we looked at the inactivation of a thin film of cuprous oxide where the droplet doesn't go in completely. Uh, it inactivates the virus pretty well in half an hour which is an improvement. But if we make a thick film, so the droplet goes right in. So by thick, I only mean like 50 microns thick. It's not that uh, thick. Even in zero minutes, which is basically Alex, our collaborator, just putting the droplet on and then pulling it off, which is was probably about 10 seconds, um, it wiped out nearly three orders of magnitude. So you know we were down to 99.5% inactivation in seconds. So that, you know, that's a fantastic, or 99.7% reduction uh, in that one minute. Okay, so our final product now, here you can see on door handles, et cetera, uh, it's sort of a graphite color. And, you know, within a minute, it's already got rid of SARS-CoV-2 for you. Um, I just want to point out as my final, or my second to last slide, um, we did discover some interesting science on the way. So it's not much use having a porous, porous film if it just gets filled up with water and it doesn't dry in between. So we looked at the effect of a porous film on how fast things dry. So this is our control where the droplet dried in about 20 minutes. And this is the porous film and it dried about three or four times more quickly. So it is amazing to me that this is not a known phenomenon. So Mosin and I discovered a new chemical engineering phenomenon. I predicted in advance that because the film is hydrophilic, we made it hydrophilic so it imbibed the droplet quickly. I thought it would be harder to dry because we're lowering the chemical potential of the water, making it stick to the surface so it would evaporate less quickly, but it evaporates much more quickly. So this in itself is an interesting bit of science that Mosin is now studying along with an undergraduate in our department. So we just stumbled upon this on the way. And the other thing that we're working on at the moment is looking at transfer of the virus. Like how easily can you transfer it to a hand? Clearly that's an important thing. It's not just inactivating on the surface, but transferring it to a hand. 
So in our lab up there in Goodwin, we've made what we call the fake finger. So this is our fake finger where we've got this PDMS finger with skin on it and we apply a known weight and we put the sample here and we just stamp down and see how um, easily easy it is to transfer uh, virus. We've sent one of these over to Hong Kong and we have a lot of results now on the transfer of SARS-CoV-2 to finger to a finger. Uh, we're just getting ready, uh, getting our last data before publishing this, which I think will be an interesting result, how easily you can transfer SARS-CoV-2 from a solid to a finger. So that's about it. I just wanted to wrap it up by acknowledging the uh, people in my research group that have worked on this. It was very good of Steve McCartney from the NCFL and Xu Feng to, from the Service Analysis Lab to come out of um, hibernation and the lockdown to just to analyze our samples so we knew what we had. And of course, I want to acknowledge Professor Leo Poon and Professor Alex Shin um, from the University of Hong Kong where they did all the testing and the NSF for being, they didn't give me fresh money to do this research, but they allowed me to divert some funds they'd already given me for another project to work on this for a while. So um, thank you very much for listening and I'd welcome any questions that you have. Any questions for William? You must have explained everything so well that there aren't any questions, William. I, I did like the finger that you had invented though. It seems like it's gonna be useful for lots of things. <laughs> well, it was hard to get volunteers for, um, you know, for people to put their hand on SARS-CoV-2. Although I don't think it's absorbed through the skin, but um, yeah, the eh and S people were not keen on that happening. Yeah, that was probably a better route you took there. End the webinar. I want to thank everybody again uh, for their attendance. If you have any comments about how things went, uh, feel free to send them to me or suggestions for, uh, for other topics or, or people that we might include. So with that, I'll say um, again, thanks for joining us and uh, stay well. <laughs>